Hey everybody, it's Mike and welcome to Chip Damage. And today we're talking about the little system with a big heart. We're talking about the PlayStation Portable, the PSP. Now, I love this system to death. However, in the larger gaming community as a whole, it's often almost forgotten as if it were a failure in the light of its direct competitor in its time, the Nintendo DS. However, almost any system would seem like a failure in comparison to that behemoth. The DS sold 154 million units in its lifetime, more than any other console other than the PlayStation 2. And though I love the DS, a large portion of those sales are due to the fact that the DS was able to capture the casual market with games like Brain Age and Nintendogs. So the PSP may have been a distant second place with about 80 to 82 million units, but you have to keep that in perspective. That's the same amount as the Game Boy Advance and more than the Nintendo 3DS, which sold about 75 million units. And both of those consoles are seen as successes. No, I think that the PSP is often forgotten or disrespected because it came out in a time when consoles were just flying off the shelves. The 360, the Wii, the PS3, and the aforementioned DS were such massive successes, it was easy to forget about the PSP and see it almost as a uh, machine that just played slightly downgraded ports of console games like Madden and Grand Theft Auto. However, and quite luckily, most developers did not see it that way, especially in Japan. Uh, they were able to see it for what it was, an incredibly powerful handheld. Like, keep in mind, uh, as a side note, when the PSP came out, it was shocking how good its visuals were for a handheld especially. It, it was really something else. Developers were able to take advantage of that and make some really special games. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Some of the outstanding, rarer, and generally weirder games on the PSP that many people have forgotten. And hopefully somewhere along the way we'll be able to find some more appreciation and respect for this system that I love so dearly. And I know many people love so dearly. So let's get started, shall we? Oh, uh, right before that, I just want to mention, uh, as a personal note, when growing up, if you were to ask me, what my favorite video game development companies were, it would probably be Square Enix, Sega, Capcom, and Konami in order. I know things have changed. Konami's no longer on that list. But regardless, those companies went hard on the PSP, making tons of games, as you can see is, uh, by the stack next to me. So let's start with a company that probably went the hardest on it, and that would be Square Enix. So I've gone over these games in prior videos, so I'll do this briefly, but... The uh, Square Enix re-released some of their classic games on the PSP with some major face facelifts. You're looking at Final Fantasy 1, 2, and the 4 collection uh, on the PSP. So what they did for Final Fantasy 1 and 2 was they took the original 8-bit games and spruced them up. This, these games have wonderful sprites. They didn't just pretty them up, though. They added dungeons, bosses, new translations. These are the best ways to play these games. And they went above a uh, step beyond that with Final Fantasy IV, the complete collection as it's known on the PSP, where they did the same thing. They prettied it up. They added little features. They also added Final Fantasy IV, the After Years, the full sequel to Final Fantasy IV that was previously only on the Wii, and added Final Fantasy Interlude, which connects the two, uh, the original and the After Years, which is only found on this collection. So they really went above and beyond with these classics. But these weren't the only classics that they uh, did a number on. Another beloved game on the PSP that launched pretty early was Final Fantasy Tactics, The War of the Lions. Now, this was originally a PS1 game that was very beloved. This was an advanced game. This was a bit tougher than your typical uh, Final Fantasy RPG. It was a strategy RPG with a really big and winding story that was very beloved on the PS1. So, for Final Fantasy's overall 20th anniversary, Square Enix re-released this game with the War of the Lions version, which you're seeing here, with new cutscenes, a new translation, added features, bosses, classes, and two very special bonuses. Balthier, a beloved character from Final Fantasy XII, and the very famous Cloud Strife from Final Fantasy VII were added as playable characters. This is generally seen as the best version of the game. It was later released on phones, mobile phones, but it removed the new multiplayer feature that was found in the PSP version. So if you wanted to play, or if you still want to play the best version of a classic Final Fantasy game, Final Fantasy Tactics, you're going to need to get it on the PSP. Uh, and as a celebration of the series, Square Enix did something truly special on the PSP, and that was release the Final Fantasy Dissidia games. Yeah, uh, these are pretty famous exclusives on the console, and before getting into it, um, yes, this series continued with the third game, Final Fantasy Dissidia NT, 
on the PlayStation 4, and that's one of the biggest disappointments in gaming that I've had in the last couple of years. That game, while gorgeous, is terrible. It has a huge roster, but it doesn't have any of the depth found in these games. So let's talk about why these were special real, real quick, uh, starting with the first game. So this is a 3D arena fighting game. Think of Naruto Ultimate Ninja Storm or Dragon Ball Z Tenkaichi, but far more in depth. Um, while it's an open arena uh, fighting game, the characters that you choose, by the way, there are 22 characters in the original game, uh, the main hero and villain from the first 10 Final Fantasies, as well as a character, uh, Sean Toto from Final Fantasy XI, and uh, Judge Grabrandt, the villain from Final Fantasy XII. You choose from one of them, and yes, you do fight in arenas, but that's where the similarities with most fighting games end. This is also a full RPG. Every one of those characters can be leveled up to level 100 have, and have special equipment and abilities. So if you pick Cloud and your buddy picks Cloud, your Clouds will be completely different. Since there's only four face buttons on the PSP and there's about eight to 10 moves each character can have, you assign which button has which move. So you can have an entirely different move set. There's an uh, RNG element uh, where, you know, you, your enemies that you defeat drop items so you can craft new weapons. Me personally, uh, anecdotally, uh, I, was, I wanted the ultimate weapon for Sephiroth. It took me about 10 hours of gameplay to actually earn that one sword. But it was worth it. The gameplay in this game is fast. The hits feel good. It's incredibly flashy. There are tons of unlockables. All the stages are from Final Fantasy history. There's artwork and music from uh, the entire series in this one little game. This was truly special. It's fully voice acted by characters, uh, by actors who had done the characters before. This was kind of the promise that Kingdom Hearts made where you would see multiple Final Fantasy characters interact from different games. However, expanded upon it. It was so cool to see Squall fight Sephiroth or uh, Titus or Titus, however you want to say it, finally meet Zidane. Like, it was really special. I put hundreds of hours of the, into this and it remains a PSP exclusive. So if you do get the console, I do suggest you get this or you get its sequel, Final Fantasy Dissidia 012 Duo Decim. Crazy title. It's very similar to the first. All of your data, because you have a lot of, uh, if you played it like I did, you had a lot of data on the original game, will transfer to this sequel. If you have a level 100 character uh, in that game, him and all of his equipment will transfer over to this. However, the big difference was the additions of the extra characters to the, to the roster. Lightning from Final Fantasy 13, Kane from Final Fantasy 4, Tifa from FF7, Vaughn from FF12, Laguna from FF8, and Yuna from FF10 along with a bunch of other hidden characters from like Final Fantasy XIV. This was a bigger and better game with a new story that had almost everything from the original game. This would be the one to get. I, I can't spiel enough about these games, but we have a lot to get through. However, two quick bonus notes. If you download the demo of this game on the PSP, which you can still do, so please do as quickly as you can. If you download the demo, by simply having that demo, you get a bonus assist character, uh, the very famous Aerith from... Final Fantasy VII. You can't get her any other way in game. You have to have that demo. So if you want that extra bonus assist character, download that. And as a collector's note, as a overall gaming note, something that I hate happened with this game in that pre-ordered DLC never came out for this game regularly for people who didn't pre-order. If you pre-ordered this game at GameStop, you got Cloud's Kingdom Hearts outfit. Um, you know, the one wing, the bandage sword. That's the version I got. However, if you pre-ordered from Amazon, you got Tifa's Yoshitaka Amano artwork outfit. It's basically a red version of her outfit with an open back. That never came out to the public yet, so I never got that costume. That drives me nuts. By the way, tons of costumes in this game, so it didn't bother me too much. These games are worth it. Final Fantasy Dissidia series, but we have to move on. Let's get this one out of the way. I'm very excited to talk about it, uh, but I'm probably going to talk the most about this one. The next game we're going to talk about for a while and to this day, is still one of my favorite games of all time. Um, when I think about this game, I get sad, but at the same time, I smile. And that is Final Fantasy VII Crisis Core. Um, this is an incredibly special game that's still only found on the PSP. Final Fantasy VII is an incredibly important game to me, as well as many people. And Crisis Core came at a time where Final Fantasy VII was kind of having an identity crisis, uh, no pun intended, um, the movie Advent Children and uh, Dirge of Cerberus, the opinions on those wild, uh, vary wildly. Uh, the, the vibe of those uh, other games in the movie kind of 
don't line up too, too well with FF7, so some people take umbrage with it. However, this game starring Zach Fair, who is a minor character in FF7, nailed the, nailed the vibe, at least in my opinion. This game felt like a true part of FF7 and expanded upon the lore the way the best prequels do. Yeah, if I didn't mention that, this is a prequel taking a few years before FF7, kind of setting up the events. I love this game. I went through this game three times. This is a huge game, fully voiced. It looks like a very high-end PS2 game. It has a 40-hour story, but it also has 300 bonus missions that can vary in length and difficulty. Um, it, it, it kind of set the basis for the Final Fantasy VII Remake combat system. Like, it's... It's real time, but with RPG elements uh, incorporated from Final Fantasy VII. Zack is probably my final, my favorite Final Fantasy character. I, I really did love this game that much, and I strongly encourage that you, if you are a PSP owner, if you're thinking of getting it, check this game out. Uh, the hype is real on this one. I hope it gets a re-release, but there are many licensing issues um, with the music as well as actors and musicians, the famous Gact, who, are, uh, who, who portray characters in this game that... Uh, might interfere with that re-release, so it's probably going to remain a PSP exclusive. But with the popularity of FF7 Remake, I hope that's not the case. Please check this out. This is a very special game. Uh, collector's note, why is this a silver cover? Because uh, I pre-ordered this at Best Buy in the United States. Um, but if you were to just remove that, it actually has the normal cover underneath, fully uh, just like that. So the silver cover, easy to, come by, easy to come by, but it's a nice little bonus that I wanted. So yeah, Final Fantasy Crisis Core, my favorite game on the PSP, one of my favorite games of all time. Check it out. Love Zack, need more Zaction in the world. Hey, sticking with Square, we are looking at the sequel to the Parasite Eve games. Uh, that is the third birthday. Not Parasite Eve, the third birthday, just the third birthday. So if you don't know, Parasite Eve was a duology of uh, survival horror RPGs on the PS1 released uh, in the late 90s, and I believe Parasite Eve 2 was released in 2000. Um, nearly a decade later, they decided to release the third game with a completely different title, only on the PSP. This game wasn't marketed super well. It's not uh, directly apparent that it was a sequel to Parasite Eve, other than um, if people recognize the main character, Aya Brea. And it's a decent game. It's it's definitely the weakest in the Parasite Eve uh trilogy however it's not bad it's it's often derided it's just not a horror game it's very action heavy they kind of over sexualize aya a lot but it's it's solid it's worth checking out if you're a fan of the series it's definitely staying a psp exclusive so it's a game worth checking out on there the third birthday uh not parasite the third birthday just the third birthday that was funny to me all right now we're going to talk about square's most marketed game at least from what i've seen uh on the PSP, and that would be Kingdom Hearts Birth by Sleep. I love this game. As a side note, I love Kingdom Hearts. I know it's insane. I know that if you don't play every game, it doesn't make any sense, but guess what? I did play every game. Most of them are good, and this is one of the best. It's probably tied for my favorite Kingdom Hearts game along with the remix of uh, Kingdom Hearts 2. So this is a prequel set 10 years before the main Kingdom Hearts games. Uh, you play as three heroes, Terra, Aqua, and Ventus, uh, who are very similar similar to the heroes of the original Kingdom Hearts uh, series, Sora, Kairi, Riku. And essentially, you pick which one you want to play as, um, and they each have about a 10-hour campaign that culminates in a final campaign. Now, this game is not Kingdom Hearts 3, 5, 8, over 2, or Chain of Memories. It's not a cheap title made quickly to bridge uh, releases. This was a brand new Kingdom Hearts. There were new worlds in this. Uh, Cinderella, Snow White... Uh, Lilo and Stitch. You visit a lot of brand new worlds in this. And they're slightly limited in scope because it was on the PSP, but it was cool to see brand new worlds. Like if I saw Agrabah one more time or Atlantica, I would have gotten nuts. And the, the, Squ Square Enix and Disney did not cheap out on this. Um, remember, this was originally only a PSP title. It would go on to be re-released on PS3 and PS4 with new bells and whistles and features later on. But for years, it was an exclusive. They got Leonard Nimoy, Spock from Star Trek, and Mark Hamill... Luke Skywalker and the Joker to voice characters in this game. They had a huge voice cast. And I just find that so fantastic that a handheld only game would have these massive actors come and voice characters in this uh, JRPG. So yeah, I love this game. 
the story is very slow in the beginning in those uh, aforementioned three chapters. But when you get to that final chapter, this game really ties together Kingdom Hearts. If you're thinking of getting into the series and you want to kind of trim the fat, there are some titles you don't necessarily need, need to play, but you do need to play Birth by Sleep. Kingdom Hearts 3 is as much a sequel to Kingdom Hearts Birth by Sleep as it is to Kingdom Hearts 1 and 2. Check this one out. Great game. So that does it for Square for now. Um, Sony, however produced some fantastic uh, exclusives for the PSP as well as some other companies. So let's talk about that. We're, first off, we're going to talk about the slightly famous uh, exclusive Jean d'Arc or Joan of, Joan of Arc on the PSP. This was produced by Sony. However, it was made by Level 5, the company most famous for the Nino Kuni and Yokai Watch uh, series, particularly Nino Kuni. Um, this is a strategy RPG where you basically play an anime version of Joan of Arc, uh, defending France from England in the uh, 15th century. This is a tactical RPG, uh, good for any level. It, it's deep, but it's easy to get into. This is a fantastic RPG. It is a PSP exclusive. I do suggest you check this out if you're into the strategy, strategy genre. It goes really well if you pick this up along with War of the Lions. This is a little different. Like I said, it's kind of like a cutesy Joan of Arc, and if you know the history of that that part of the world at that time, it, it, that can kind of clash, but they pull it off mostly. It's it's a fantastic RPG. Jean d'Arc or Joan of Arc, if you want to say it, uh, on the PSP. Great game. Uh, another PSP exclusive uh, that I love as a fighting game fan is Soul Calibur Broken Destiny. Now, I'm a huge Soul Calibur fan, and this is mostly based on Soul Calibur 4. However, there were some changes. They did, unfortunately, strip most of the single-player elements of this game. However, they added two new characters. They added Dumb Pierre who I hate, who's basically like this mustachioed pimp looking villain with like hand blades. But Kratos from God of War is in this game, fully playable. I think that was an amazing get. Uh, that He was not on any console version of Soul Calibur. He is only in this game. So if you want to get Nightmare versus Kratos right here, and I'm hoping one day they do like a uh, Soul Calibur all-encompassing like dream match so we can get Kratos versus Spawn. I just want that. Please let that happen. I, I'm dreaming, but... Soul Calibur Broken Destiny, cool exclusive on the PSP. Moving on. <sighs> okay, the next game I am uh, hesitant to talk about, but everyone knows I'm a big Dead or Alive fan, and there was a Dead or Alive game on the PSP. This came out pretty late in life, and that is Dead or Alive Paradise. This is a spinoff of the Dead or Alive Extreme Beach Volleyball games, which I love. However, this one's a little different. Nowhere on this box does it advertise actual volleyball. Remember, the game is called Paradise. It doesn't say volleyball anywhere on it because the volleyball while in the game is not the main part of the game. The main part of the game is like the mini games and taking pictures of the girls. They like pose for you and you make little vignettes. It, it's, it's a little bit extra creepy. And they also added a character that's like from Tecmo's Pachinko uh, machines like the 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 screens that play in Machinko machines. I forget her name. It's like Aoki or Yuki. She's really creepy looking in an already really creepy game. Um, if I had to say something nice, at least all the mini games are intact. They they can be kind of fun. The gambling and and the visuals are nice. Like it's very uh, appealing looking. But it it just crosses that line. It, Dead or Alive did this around this time where it was like, hey, yeah, this is a sexy game. But then it kind of started crossing into, hey, this is kind of creepy. But it is a slightly rare game on the PSP. Like I said, it was released late. There was no greatest hits or anything. There is no downloadable version of this game. So it's more of a collector's piece. Dead or Alive Paradise on the PSP. Not as good as the one on the Xbox, let me tell you. Another exclusive for the PSP, uh, until fairly recently, were the Prinny games. Um, Prinny, if you don't know, is a little uh, penguin creature uh, from the Disgaea series. It's like a peg-legged penguin demon. I know that sounds weird, but they're actually really cute. Uh, Disgaea is a series of strategy RPGs that's uh, been on PlayStation consoles for years and years. And Prinny's kind of the familiar of one of the demons, uh, one of the enemies in the game, one of the characters. And this is a 2D platformer that is incredibly difficult. And the whole gimmick of this game is that there is a mode where there, you play as a Prinny. And every time you die, you are replaced by a new Prinny. So, and you have 999 Prinnies. So, oh, and you die in one hit. So you have 999 hits essentially to get through the whole game. That sounds like a lot, but you eat through them pretty quick. Um, there was a sequel to this game, which I actually do not have because it is very rare and uh, decently collectible. You're looking at a hundred bucks. This collector's edition of the game, which comes with it, like the soundtrack and art book, is decently collectible itself. This runs to about eighty dollars. This is a really fun game with gorgeous sprites. I do suggest you check this one out. However, there's a new way to do that. Very recently, 
printing one and two were released on the Nintendo Switch in a package, and that is a fine way to play these games. But for a while, for almost over a decade, they were PSP exclusives. Pretty, check them out. Uh, not only were there some great exclusives, there were a few ports of games with extended features, like uh, this game right here, and that is X-Men Legends 2. This is um, the sequel to X-Men Legends. These games were very popular in the Xbox and PS2 uh, era of games, and the sequels to these would be the even more famous Marvel Ultimate Alliance games. Uh, the reason I bring this version up is that multiple there was a lot of versions of X-Men Legends 2 made. Some of them had exclusive characters. Um, I think the N-Gage version got Beast and the PC version got Sabretooth and Pyro and those kind of suck. The PSP version got four exclusive characters. Cannonball, not bad. But it also got Dark Phoenix, X-Men, Nate Gray, like the most powerful mutant or one of them, and Cable. Yeah, this great game got four awesome characters um, found only on the PSP version. So it's kind of like the definitive version of a classic game. If you're into these games, these top-down beam up superhero games, if you like Ultimate Alliance, check this one out. And if you have a PSP, get this version for those characters. This is a great game to play on the go. So X-Men Legends 2 Rise of Apocalypse, really good exclusive characters on this one. Moving on, like I said earlier, Sega, one of my favorite developers, as many will know, uh, also got on the PSP with a few titles. Um, the first one we'll talk about is Valkyria Chronicles 2. Now, if you don't know, Valkyria Chronicles was a PS3 exclusive that was very beloved. It's basically anime World War II. Uh, the, the games kind of take place during in between World War I and II and in a fictional continent of Europa, not Europe. But it's told in a, a serious enough way uh, at the same time having like an anime flair that the game was fantastic. Now, a lot of people had an issue that the second game here was a PSP exclusive and did not star the soldiers from the first game. This was about like a uh, military academy students. Um, however, though it was somewhat disconnected from the first game, this game is excellent. This game looks good. It plays good. The characters are good. They're not the characters from the first one. It's a different flavor, but it's excellent. It's deep. It's heavy. It's a good, like, it's a mix between real-time strategy and RPGs. Uh, you use firearms, you, you uh, angle is a very important uh, like angle of your weapon, where you're firing, it's all very important, it's real time. So please check this out if you're a fan of the series, if you've only ever played the first one, which was recently played uh, re-released on the PlayStation 4, check this out if you have a PSP. This is somewhat sought after though, this is valuable. This game was not re-released as a downloadable title on anything else, so you might have to spend a pretty penny on this one, but it's worth finding if you can. It is a worthy follow-up to a great PlayStation 3 game, which is now a PlayStation 4 game, Valkyria Chronicles 2. And Sega being Sega had to be Sega and release a couple Sonic games on the PSP. And you are looking at Sonic Rivals 1 and 2. Um, these are just okay. These aren't bad at all. They're just not incredibly special. Basically, it's all about one-on-one um, -on -one racing in this game. You can play as in the first game. It's like Sonic, Knuckles, Silver, and Shadow. And you, you basically race through levels um, and that's pretty much the same thing with the second one, but they added a few new characters. The, the thing with these games are they're 2.5 D and they're, though they're pretty fast, it's kind of hard to see what's going on. Like the screen is kind of pulled in, um, the music's good and, and some of the ideas in here are pretty fun for levels, but it, it's just a little bit clustered. Um, they're solid. They're not re-released on anything else. They're definitely in the mid tier of Sonic games, but they're worth checking out if you have a PSP, Sonic Rivals 1 and 2. You always got to give Sonic some love, right? At least I do. Okay, now we're going into another company that went hard on the PSP with both new releases and re-releases, and that is my beloved Capcom. So, I've spoken about Power Stone on a couple of our videos, but let's talk about something I haven't specifically talked about before. That is the Power Stone Collection, only on the PSP. What this is, very simply, is Power Stone 1 and 2 from the Dreamcast ported into one game with some features added. There's some new weapons, some features from Power Stone 2 were brought into one. Power Stone 1 is still two player, Power Stone 2 is still four player, and you can play wirelessly. I mean, it may not be as fun as playing on a TV, but it actually may be cheaper at this point to just have four people playing PSPs next to each other to play this game, uh, because Power Stone 1 and 2 are pretty expensive. Um, yeah, it may not be quite the same as a TV, but this is still a great game or series of games. Um, and this was the latest way to play them. There's still no other way to play Power Stone. So if you want to get both the games as quickly and easily as possible, check them out on PSP. They're Capcom beat-em-up classics or fighting classics, as it were. Power Stone Collection, only on the PSP. 
Moving on to another re-release, but a little bit different. Um, I'm actually gonna bring these both up at the same time as Mega Man Maverick Hunter X and Mega Man Powered Up. So what these are, are enhanced remakes of Mega Man X and Mega Man 1. Kaiji Inafune, the uh, head of Mega Man, who's gone on to be somewhat infamous since then, uh, wanted to kind of reboot the Mega Man X series starting first. The X one came first. He wasn't sure whether to do Mega Man X9 or start from the beginning. So he decided to start from the beginning again and kind of retcon a lot of things in the original Mega Man X and that rubs a lot of people the wrong way. Like this kind of changes the story. However, it's still an excellent game. It's not a 2D game, it's 2.5D, which some people don't like, but I think this is a pretty good version. Mega Man X is one of my favorite games of all time, and I think this, this carries the legacy pretty good. It had some bells and whistles, it had a little anime movie called like The Day of Sigma on it, which is very cool. Uh, they remixed some things. Um, it, the story is not why I play these games, it's the gameplay, and this was a cool version. It has like uh, an early 2.5D look, it's not too cluttered, it's not ugly. It may not be quite as great as the original, but it's a great way to play it. And this one was not re-released anywhere else, so you have to play it on the PSP. Uh, this was this is somewhat infamous, but I like this one. If you're a Mega Man fan, um, check it out. Like this was during the time when Mega Man was just starting to come back, and then he disappeared, and now he's kind of back again. Um, so this is worth checking out just as a uh, piece of Mega Man history. And just like with the uh, the other one, Mega Man Powered Up, it, it's worth playing. This one's a little different. This came later. And this one had even more features. You can actually play as almost all the robot masters or the bosses of Mega Man in this. And this has a 2.5D style. However, this one is very cutesy looking. So I can see how some people don't like it. Like there's Chibi and then there's Mega Man powered up Chibi. Like his head is enormous. Um, but it's still Mega Man 1 and you can make it as difficult or make it almost as difficult as Mega Man 1 because if you go back and play Mega Man 1 now, it's a little rough. 2 is the most famous one. I like 1, but you know, it, it was kind of like almost a demo for the rest of the series. This is a more refined game and if you can get over the QT look, it's solid. It's fun. It's Mega Man by Capcom. You can't beat that. So yeah, Mega Man Maverick Hunter X, Mega Man Powered Up. And as a side note, this was never released in North America on the uh, PlayStation Store, only in Japan. Apparently there were too many technical difficulties in the North American version, so you need to get a physical copy of Powered Up to play it. Worth it though, great games. So, sticking with Capcom still, we are looking at Beautiful Joe Red Hot Rumble. I love this game. So, this was a GameCube release as well, but a little bit later it came out on the PSP with some extra bells and whistles. The meme is alive. This version, and only on this version, can you play as Dante from the Devil May Cry series. Yes, Dante and Beautiful Joe are best friends and whatever there was a PlayStation version of a Beautiful Joe game, uh, Dante would appear. But this is a little different than um, all the other Beautiful Joe games. So instead of a 2D uh, beat-em-up platformer, this is more of a party game like Smash Brothers, but with objectives. This is a crazy game and uh, yeah, you can have four players fighting each other. At the same time, the stage is moving while you have to like gather gold coins and it can be a real cluster. However, it's a really fun game when you have two people, I find. Like, anything more than that you really can't see. And you can't play it by yourself. It does have, like, full missions. And there are more missions in the PSP version than the GameCube version. This is really an enhanced version that's ex with a lot of exclusive features. So there are only four beautiful Joe games. And in, if you want the best versions of each of them, you're usually going to go with the PlayStation versions. They're not as pretty. Just like the PSP one isn't as pretty as the GameCube one. But there's more stuff in it. Dante's in it. Like, come on, Dante. So... Check this one out if you want to have some fun with buddies uh, with the wireless or ad hoc mode, if they have a PSP in this game as well, or if you just want a fun party game to play by yourself even, it's fun. Beautiful Joe, Red Hot Rumble, it's got Dante. So moving on to another remake, enhanced remake, Ultimate Ghosts and Goblins. So with the recent release of the new Ghosts and Goblins games, the idea of the visuals in Ghosts and Goblins being a little controversial has come up, like some people don't like the look of the new one. That was almost the same exact deal with this. This came out the same year as the Powered Up and Maverick Hunter X games in 2006. Capcom really wanted to push 2.5D, and I actually like the way this looks a lot. It's like early 2.5D, but it's very sharp, very colorful, very, it pops. You can kind of lose Arthur occasionally in this game. Um, it can be a little hard to see if you're accustomed to uh, traditional NES or Super Nintendo or Super, uh, Sega Genesis. Uh, Ghosts and Goblins, but it, it, it really pops. Like it, it makes my eyes happy to look at this. You can play this on an easy mode. Yeah, imagine that in Ghosts and Goblins. A normal mode, which is like doable by normal humans, or ultimate mode, which makes it like classic Ghosts and Goblins, which I'm going to tell you I was never a huge fan of because I'm a sissy and can't beat it. Yeah, 
Ghosts and Goblins was always a little too unforgiving for me to enjoy for long periods of time. So I kind of liked the easier difficulties in this. I don't say that often, but Ghosts and Goblins can be just kind of unfair. You didn't, do need to revisit every level in this game again, though. They didn't skimp on that. This is a beautiful version of the game. If you're looking for some Ghosts and Goblins actions after picking the one up on the Switch, or if you don't want to play that one, check this out. Another PSP exclu exclusive, Ultimate Ghosts and Goblins, only on the PSP. Good game. Oh, now we're getting into one of my absolute favorites on the console. The first game I had on the PSP. That is Darkstalk Darkstalkers Chronicles, The Chaos Tower. So, if you don't know, Darkstalkers is a series of fighting games that Capcom has completely forgotten about. Uh, except for Morgan. So, Darkstalkers is... Uh, completely based on old universal horror movies. Uh, every character is some trope of horror character. Vampires, yetis, Frankensteins, werewolves, mummies, fish people, a giant bee, uh, ghost samurai. Very cool characters, and they're drawn in the Street Fighter Alpha, like anime-esque style. And um, unfortunately, there just aren't that many US releases of the game anymore. Like, of course, you will see, if you're a fan of the Marvel vs. Capcom or... Uh, Capcom vs. NK games, you will see Morgan, the very sexy succub the succubus with the uh, green hair. Everyone knows her, Felicia, the naked cat girl. Um, they're from this game. So, despite not getting many releases, at least we got this. The Chaos Tower is kind of a remix of Darkstalkers 2 and 3, like, put together. It has all the Darkstalkers characters. There's not a lot. There's only 18. But they took all the characters from the three games and kind of crammed them into this remixed version that is just great. It has everything from Darkstalkers. There's a lot of unlockables that you go up the titular Chaos Tower and unlock. Um, I couldn't get enough of this. It just looks cool. It sounds cool. It's like the last physical Darkstalkers anything that North America got. Like this is, this is it. This is what we're getting. Like there's no new Darkstalkers, at least in physical form. There was a digital re-release um, coming out. So if you were ever interested where Felicia and, uh, and Morgan came from, check this game out. It's fun. Alone or with a buddy, Darkstalkers, fantastic game. The Chaos Tower. All right, you didn't think Capcom would do anything on a console uh, without bringing in their big, without bringing in their big guns, um, and that big gun would be Street Fighter. Uh, Street Fighter. I was, I'm sorry, forgive me for the time. Street Fighter Alpha Three Max, also known as Street Fighter Three Double Upper in Japan. Um, what this is is the beloved Street Fighter. Alpha 3, remix for the PSP. Street Fighter Alpha 3 is an incredible game to begin with. It was on a dozen consoles. It was on the Dreamcast. I believe there was a Sega Saturn port. Um, it's been since re-released on the PlayStation 4 as part of, and Xbox One and Switch as part of the Street Fighter Anniversary Collection. However, this is a very special port of Street Fighter Alpha 3. So, Alpha 3 was ported to the Game Boy Advance, strangely, but very well, with three bonus characters. Uh, it... It was uh, Maki from Final Fight 2, it was Eagle from Street Fighter 1, and it was Yun from Street Fighter 3. However, when the PSP version was made, not only did it bring over all three of those characters, it also dropped the exclusive Ingrid. So yes, this game I believe has 39 characters, the largest roster in Street Fighter history at the time, until it was later surpassed by Street Fighter 4, but the largest roster for Street Fighter Alpha 3 uh, of all time. Um, those characters add a lot. They're cool characters. This uh, game also had a ton of modes. Like every mode that you can imagine in a fighter. Two on one. One versus two. An arcade mode. A story mode. Uh, time attack. Uh, survival. Like there are so many modes. It's literally like when you turn the game on, the menu just has like a ton of tabs. And when you select it, you have a ton of characters. And then there's three styles of every character. The A-ism, X-ism, V-ism. I don't mess with isms too much. I always forget what they do. But yeah, this one uh, has an exclusive character in Ingrid. If you don't know... Ingrid is like a mystery I never want solved by Capcom. Ingrid was a character from a scrapped game, Capcom uh, All-Stars, which eventually became Capcom Fighting Evolution, which is a terrible fighting game on the Xbox and PS2, but she was brought over. She has no real backstory, but someone at Capcom loves her because she is somehow in this game. She's also a costume for Kareen in Street Fighter V, but yeah, I'm getting off topic. I'm sorry. Street Fighter... Alpha 3 Max on the PSP, the best version of one of the best fighting games ever made, and it's only on the PSP. Check it out. Speaking of fighting games, PSP had no shortage of them, as we've already seen with Street Fighter and Soul Calibur, but there were a bunch of others that I'll go through very quickly. 
Um, Arc System Works got in on it. So they released Blaze Blue and a slew of Guilty Gear games on it. Um, Action Core Plus, which I love. This was my favorite Guilty Gear for many, many years. The PS2 version and the PSP version are nearly identical. Uh, they released Blaze Blue, which was a big uh, hit, kind of a weird pseudo successor to Guilty Gear on the 360. It's still going around this day, but the PSP got some love from it. And then there's this little bizarre one, Guilty Gear Judgment. No one talks about this. This is, this is completely forgotten. It has Guilty Gear X2, which is an older Guilty Gear title, which is fantastic, but it also has a 2D beat-em-up mode. Yeah, like Guilty Gear with its beautiful sprites has gotten a game with 2D, a 2D beat-em-up that no one talks about. It's not fantastic, but it's unique and not on anything else. So Guilty Gear Judgment, along with Guilty Gear Action Core Plus and Blaze Blue Portable, great access games. Uh, Arc System Works, who's really rocking now with the new Guilty Gear and Dragon Ball games, sure did have a piece of it on the PSP. So check them out. Okay. Now we're going to talk about some of the more rare and expensive gems on the PSP. We are talking about the Persona series. So Shin Megami Tensei Persona uh, is a very popular series now with Persona 5 in particular kind of being a smash hit on the PS5. But really, it started with the PS2 um, in terms of popularity. Persona 3 was a massive hit very late in the PS2's life cycle, and it made games come over uh, that were priorly unreleased or not very successful. And they did it with the PSP. So after Persona 3 was a huge hit, they released Persona 1 on the PSP. Now Persona 1 did come out on the PlayStation 1, but it was a bizarre chopped up version. Characters' races were changed to be more politically correct, which some people took umbrage with. Um, there was cut content. There was a, a path in this game bound to a character named the Snow Queen that was cut. Dialogue was changed. So they went back and they decided to bring a more pure version of this game over where they kind of undid all that, added back in the lost content, and they added Persona 1. This is an incredibly old style RPG though, if you're if you're curious. Um, you're thinking isometric, very slow ba turn-based combat. The story is your typical Shin Megami affair, which I love, but you know, it, it's students who are encountering demons and they must fight them with their inner power called Persona. It, it's fine. Um, it's a little too old school for my taste, but it is a piece of gaming history. This version will set you back though. This collector's edition came with a two disc CD set. This is well over $150 at this point. This didn't get a re-release. It's not in any other consoles. Well, this version of the game. So this one can set you back, which leads us right into another game that can really set you back with about the same price, 150 to 200. It's Persona 2 Innocent Sin. This is even weirder. So this game is a standalone on the PSP. It was only released in North America on the PSP. However, there is another game called Persona 2 Eternal Punishment on the PS1. That's a sequel to this game. So let me, let me try to straighten that out. Persona 2 Innocent Sin on the PSP has a sequel, direct sequel, Persona 2 Eternal Punishment on the PS1. The sequel came out years ago only on the PS1. They did not bring over the first part until years later on the PSP. So the second one came out first and the first one came out second on different consoles. I love localization. I don't know how big companies do this. It, it's, I, it's something that still happens today, but thankfully not as much. Anyway, this is a little bit of a better game. It's still very archaic. It's still um, isometric, a little older, but it's a little snappier. You can switch your personas on the fly a little bit more in this. Um, the story is... You, uh, you and your team of very attractive students, it's always like, you know, students in Persona, uh, must fight an enemy named Joker, for my Persona 5 fans, um, who has cast a spell that makes rumors come true in the town. Um, good game, a little better than Persona 1, but still a little too archaic for my taste, but highly collectible. Very cool box, came with a soundtrack, Persona. And to complete the trilogy, the beloved game that got this whole, tri uh, this whole series kicked off in the West, Persona 3, came to the West, uh, Persona 3 Portable in particular. So this is also pretty sought after. You're looking at over $100. No collector's edition for this. It did come with a pre-order hat though, Junpei's hat, if you're familiar. It's basically a blue hat with the Persona symbol on the front with a Persona symbol on it. I don't wear hats, so I gave it away. But uh, what this is, the main difference is, is that in the original Persona, it can only be male. This allows you to pick a male or female character and it can change the story drastically. And there was a bit of an open world um, choosing area, like where to go, like a small town to kind of wander through in the original PS2 version. However, that couldn't fit on the UMD, the disc for the PSP. So it's more of a, a, a choosing screen. Like when you want to go somewhere, you just kind of go to a menu and directly choose that. It sounds like a big loss, but it's not. It just kind of speeds the game up. You lose a little bit of the flow of the game, but it's an excellent version of the game. This is a long game, so it being portable is a pretty big benefit. 
Can I say it's a definitive version? No, because there is a PS2 re-release called FES or Festival that has bonus a bonus campaign, a 30-hour campaign. Um, that this version does not. However, this has exclusive content too. Like I said, the aforementioned female character storyline. Vincent, the main character of the soon-to-be-released at the time uh, Catherine game, is just in this game. Like you meet Vincent from Catherine in this game. That's cool. It's only in this version. So unfortunately, I can't say this is the definitive version. You're gonna probably have to play through Persona 3 like two or three times if you wanna see all the content all the versions have. But this is an excellent version, the only portable version, and one I strongly suggest. So Persona 3 Portable, rounding out the Persona Trilogy on the PSP. All right, now we're getting near the end of our video. Thank you for sticking with me this long. We're getting to one of my favorite companies as a child who has since fallen from grace so hard they have left a crater that is Konami. Konami was still in our good graces back in the late 2000s when these games were made, so please uh, try to get out of your mind for at least this conversation, all the bad stuff that they've done since then. Let's start with Castlevania The Dracula X Chronicles. I love this game. So what The Dracula Chronicle X is, is there is a Castlevania game called Rondo of Blood, which recently got re-released on the PS4. It's my favorite 2D Castlevania of the old classic Castlevanias where you play as Richter Belmont of Super Smash Brothers fan. That game never officially came to the West. Uh, that game was never localized uh, until 2018. But what did come here was a 2.5D remake of that game. So that's what this the main meat of this game is. It is a 2.5D remake of Rondo of Blood. He plays Richter Belmont, who has to, guess what, kill Dracula. And that's it. It's not an unappealing look. Some people don't like it. It's just a little dark. It's a little, like, muddled, you know, those early 2.5D games, and 2.5D games to this day in some cases. However, it's still an exclusive on the PSP. It's the only way you can play that version. But there's a fantastic bonus in this. You can unlock the original version of Rondo of Blood in this game, and it's 16-bit glory. I love that game. That version in particular, I find a little better. I can play it to death, and I've played it through on the PSP. That's a great version. You do have to unlock it, which is a little weird, but that's not all. You can also unlock Castlevania Symphony of the Night, the Castlevania that needs no introduction. If you don't know what that is, I'm going to need a whole video to explain to you why you should know what that is. So this is three games. Castlevania, Rondo of Blood, Rondo of Blood Remake, and Symphony of the Night all on one UMD. It's a hell of a package. It kind of stinks that you have to unlock Rondo Classic and Symphony of the Night, but you have a good game there with 2.5D in the very beginning. So check this out. This is cheap. There's no more Castlevania games coming out, so you might as well fill up the back catalog with some good ones. And to play these portably is fantastic. Um, Castlevania, The Dracula X Chronicles. Konami also released originally only on PSP with Silent Hill Origins. Um, even though this was not made by Team Silent, who was the direct creators of Silent Hill 1, 2, 3, and 4, a lot of that team had left by then, this is a solid title. It would later go on to be re-released on the PS2. However, uh, both versions are fantastic. This is fun to take on the go. It's a little less scary because it's on the go, but it is something special. Um, this is a good game. This is one of the last good Silent Hill games and one of the last Silent Hill games period that was made. So check this one out, Silent Hill Origins. Now we're getting to... My favorite series of all time, um, some of the games that were brought to the PSP. I think some of you are, uh, can tell by what I'm wearing, where I'm going with this. We are going with the Metal Gear Solid games on the PSP. No, we're not going through Metal Gear Acid. That is a bizarre, not terrible, but bizarre um, like tactical RPG on the PSP that no one really asked for. It's not that bad, but I don't want to go through them. Metal Gear Acid, weird side titles that are non-canon on the PSP. What we're talking about is Metal Gear Portable Ops and Portable Ops Plus, its expansion. So... Where to begin with this? Um, Metal Gear Portable Ops is not a Metal Gear directed by Hideo Kojima. Kojima has not outright disavowed this game, but this game in the canon, its canonicity is kind of debated, whether the story counts or not, whether it's part of the series. It can be or it cannot be. That's up to you. I choose to say it is because this is a good game with a good story. So this takes place right after Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater, um, I believe in the late 60s if memory serves, and you pick up with Naked Snake or, you know, not yet Big Boss, just Snake, uh, still Naked Snake, and this is the introduction of some classic Metal Gear characters. This is the introduction of Gray Fox. This is the introduction of Roy Campbell. Um, it's a great way to see what happened to Snake right after Metal Gear Solid 3 because you know things got messed up after that game. 
Um, the story is good. It has doesn't have cutscenes. It has comic book cam, uh, panels done by Ashley Wood, who has uh, who has done Metal Gear comics in the past. It's kind of an abstract, thick line, inky style. Very cool looking. This game is a little clunky, however. Um, you know, the PSP only had one stick, one one control stick. Uh, so it was a little hard to control. The camera was a little rough and you can only carry so much equipment on you, but it was very cool. It was a good story. It worked. It looked good. One of the main gimmicks of this game was that you can capture, sh capture soldiers to do missions for you, but it was a little rough capturing them. You literally had to knock them out and drag them to a truck, uh, on the edge of the stage. So like no matter where you were, you had to drag these soldiers to capture them. That really slowed things down, but it's a fun game with a good story, some cool boss fights, Check it out. I say it's canon. It hasn't been disavowed. It's probably not going to be. It's just never been re-released in any of the Metal Gear collections. This is still a solemn PSP exclusive. You can only get this on here. If you want to see young Gray Fox and how Snaker at Met Roy Campbell, this is the game for you. It also doesn't hurt the following title at all. Like The way they de develop the next game in the series, Metal Gear Peace Walker, it can either be a direct sequel to 3 or this game, Portal Ops, but it makes a little bit more sense if it's a direct sequel to this. So Check it out. Don't let its lack of being in any collection fool you. This is a good Metal Gear game. It did get a direct standalone expansion, by the way, Metal Gear Portable Ops. If you're out there collecting, this does not include the campaign. This is a multiplayer-only disc with some missions on it. So don't be fooled. You need this one to play the campaign, and this is just a weird multiplayer game um, that's, you know, most of, you're not going to find too many people playing it with you. Uh, that was released later. That's why this one is usually dirt cheap. This is not the main game. This is just a standalone expansion. So don't get it confused. But yet again, Metal Gear Portable Ops, great game, but not quite as good as the last game we're going to talk about. That is the aforementioned Metal Gear Peace Walker. What you're seeing here is the collector's edition of the game. This was a late release for the PSP in 2010. So after Metal Gear Solid 4, Hideo Kojima said, I'm not making Metal Gear anymore. He said that after almost every single Metal Gear and he keeps doing it. But it was pretty sure, we were pretty sure after 4, the way that story ended, um, that that would be the last, but it was not. Two years after that, this game was released. And originally, in early marketing material, this game was named Metal Gear Solid 5 Peace Walker. That's how important the story this game uh, would be, the story of this game would be. Um, just as a note on the development, so this game uh, was made T for Teen so that it would sell more. That was a edict by Konami, an early kind of splintering between Kojima and Konami. But at the time, uh, it wasn't too much of a big deal. Metal Gear Portable Ops was not incredibly violent, but it was rated M. Uh, so that was one of the things about this game. Also, there, was, there are talks that Kojima wanted to start making a different type of game, not purely an action game, more of an army building game. And uh, elements of that were incorporated into this. So... What's enough of the preamble of the game? What's the game about? Yet again, after Metal Gear Portable Ops, you pick up again with Naked Snake, who is uh, still not Big Boss yet. And he uh, is the head of a small army of um, mercenaries, good mercenaries. You know, they, uh, they work for whoever, but you get the idea that they're, they're more positive than negative, more of a side for good than bad. And they are hired by a professor and a young girl from Costa Rica to come liberate their country from terrorists. And Snake obliges being the nice guy that he is. And this game plays wonderfully. This game really pushed the PSP. This game had a huge campaign. It was perfectly set up to be portable. You select your mission, you're in and out, but some of these were in depth. Um, the bosses are a matter of, I'll say contention. You do not fight the normal superhumans that you would in other Metal Gear games. You fight giant robots. But that's Awesome. Um, yeah, I miss fighting freaks and monsters and, and superhumans. However, the robots are great. Some there's there's a couple walkers, some that fly. You have a huge variety of weapons, and you are just you the the, the gear in this game is unbelievable. Instead of a huge part of this game is still recruiting soldiers. Instead of dragging them back to a truck, though, this is the game that originated something that would be famous in Metal Gear 5, the Fulton recovery system, where you tie a balloon to an, a knocked out man and he just floats away to your base. The mother base feature that was included in Metal Gear 5 really started here. You had a base where you captured soldiers and they would go out on little missions and sorties for you and bring you back stuff and build you gear and you built your own Metal Gear and it was it, it's really a huge game for something that was on such a small disc. Luckily, this game was later re-released on 
almost all the modern, uh, at the time, the 360 and PS3, the modern consoles, because this game story was essential to understanding the then upcoming Metal Gear 5. Like, you could not get what's going on. Yet again, though, this game got kind of snubbed in the history department. Um, for those of you who know Metal Gear 5, what happens in the beginning kind of scrubs this game. Uh, it, it makes it almost not matter, and that's a shame because this game's story is good. Uh, they brought back Ashley Wood for the cutscenes to draw, so they look fantastic. The voice acting is good. This was the last game that David Hayter voiced Snake. Uh, for fans out there who, who love David Hayter, this was his last hurrah. This game was incredible. Please check this out, and that's to say nothing of its incredible multiplayer. Check this. It had four-person multiplayer. We can each play a snake, your own snake. You can customize the way snake in this. So I'll never forget this anecdote here. Four, me and three friends were hanging out in my living room, and we were going to go fight a boss on a mission, and each one of us wore, you know, slightly different gear. I'm more of an assault guy. I like to move quick and hit hard, so I usually don't wear a lot of armor. So I had like a, st a lightly armored set. My buddy had a heavy armored set. The other one had a, like an invisible, like a, a purely stealth outfit. And my other friend just was wearing a tuxedo because it looked funny. And you fought monsters from Monster Hunter. Yes, Konami made a deal with Capcom to have Monster Hunter bosses in this game, in the multiplayer mode. That doesn't happen anymore. Capcom, Capcom and Konami are regularly seen as rivals to many. One has Resident Evil, one has Silent Hill, so on and so forth. And they came together to make this game. You fight, and this is a, uh, this is a nice thing for my Metal Gear Solid 1 fans. Metal Gear Solid Rex is the most famous robot in this series. They made a living dinosaur version of him and named him Gear Rex uh, and turned him into a monster in the style of Monster Hunter. So you fought a new type of monster along with classic monsters like Rathalos from Monster Hunter in this game. This game was crazy. It was insane. I can't gush enough about it. It was a great way to go out for the PSP. It was one of their big last exclusives. And what you're seeing here is the Clark's Edition, like I said. Uh, this is pr uh, worth quite a pretty penny, but you can get this game digitally or on a number of consoles. It came with like a dossier um, with all the art and comic uh, panels in it. Uh, there's spoilers in there, so I'm not going to open it up. This is what the regular edition of the game looks like. So you can still get this on the PSP or you can get it anywhere else, like I said. But this is an essential Metal Gear game. Do not sleep on this or Portable Ops, but especially this one. Um, Metal Gear. Man, I, I just I miss it. I don't know if I ever wanted to come back without the team that made it happen in the first place, but... You know, I'll take another re-release. So, that wraps up our top talk on the games of the PSP. I have one little bonus. You didn't think I'd get uh, through an entire talk on the PSP without bringing up the media that it was brought up on, the media that the games were put on, the UMDs. UMDs were small discs uh, that the PSP used. They didn't use cartridges. Uh, this is the way they were able to store so much data and look so good. A big part of what made UMDs, uh, a big part of their appeal was that they could hold whole move. Uh, Hold whole movies. And they did. There was an entire line of movies and TV shows produced for the PSP. If you go to any pawn shop or retro gaming store, you're going to see a bucket of UMD movies that nobody wants. They put literally every type of movie or TV show imaginable on these things. And you got to understand this was in the time when cell phone technology uh, wasn't so great. So you couldn't watch or stream an entire movie just on your phone. So like having a little movie with you was pretty novel, but it wore off pretty quickly. So... I didn't buy a lot of these, but there were some I just had to have because they were hysterical. So I love Cowboy Bebop. It's my favorite thing in life. So I picked it up for $4.99, as you can see in a bin. And so I have the Cowboy Bebop movie on UMD if I ever want, want to watch it. But like I said, UMDs ran, ran the gamut. It was really random what they released, but they released like tons of stuff. I also got Short Circuit starring Johnny Five, if any of you are uh, aware of this one. So yeah, Cowboy Bebop to Short Circuit. You can find a ton of these movies. These are dirt cheap. No one collects these. I mean, for whatever reason, the Cowboy Bebop uh, disc one, the season one is kind of rare on UMD, but like I want to meet a UMD collector. I want someone who has ever UMD. I remember they were giving away free copies of Lords of Dogtown. Remember that movie with certain PSPs? They were giving away Advent Children UMDs. These were everywhere. I used to work in a game store and these would like literally clog the back room because once phones started being able to play movies, portable movie players kind of became more uh, easy to obtain. Like UMDs are just everywhere. It was kind of a failed medium. But hey, it was interesting. I miss these little discs. I wish all discs had little protectors like this on them so they weren't so brittle. Man, Sony just can't make a can't make it out of the gate with the with the media. Remember uh, beta rays, the betas. Anyway, that wraps up my talk on the PSP, and thank you for joining me on this very long journey, this very long conversation.
But I hope somewhere along the way, all kidding aside, you either gained or remembered some recognition, some respect for this powerful little handheld that so that I love so much. Uh, PSP came out in late 2004 in Japan and early 2005 in March in America and went on to make games until about late 20, 2011, early 2012 when it was succeeded by its successor, the PlayStation Vita, the PS Vita. And the Vita just, though it was a fantastic system that I'll go into into another video, just couldn't carry the momentum of the PSP. And it sold terribly. And because of that, Sony decided to discontinue their line of handheld consoles. And that's a real shame. This system was great, the Vita was great, and they were the, and particularly the PSP was the only contender that Nintendo ever had in the portable market. Now, I love my Switch to death, I love Nintendo, but I really do miss dedicated handheld consoles. And we may never get them again. The Switch is, is portable, but I see it more as a home console with the ability to travel. So, even though we may never get a great handheld console like the PSP again, that's the joy of collecting. While we move forward into the future of gaming, which is going to be great, it's always fun to go back and see where everything started and have some fun. So, please join me when, as I go on to look at other consoles like the PSP in the future because there's still so much to talk about. I still have so many consoles to go through. If you haven't seen my other videos on the Xbox, Dreamcast, or Saturn, please go check them out. My name has been Mike. This has been Chip Damage. Take care of yourselves. Good night.